Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of In Conversation Live. Lovely to have you with us uh, this evening. We've got nearly 500 people signed up, so we're very happy with that. Well, tonight's guest is the super special Professor Jane Somerville. She's an emeritus professor of cardiology at Imperial College, London, best known for uh, defining the concept and subspecialty of grown ups with congenital heart disease, as well as being chosen to be physician involved in Britain's first heart transplant in 1968 with Donald Ross. We'll definitely be talking about that. Jane was educated first at a boys prep school in North Wales, talking about that too, then Queen's College London and later Guy's Hospital Medical School. She was drawn to surgery initially, but then she chose to pursue a career in cardiology at the National Heart, uh, the Hospital for Sick Children in Great Ormond Street and later at the Brompton. Her work led to the opening of the world's first dedicated ward for children and adolescents with congenital heart disease and the first World Congress of Pediatric Cardiology in London and a Gooch charity, uh, which later renamed the Somerville Foundation in her honour. The medical professionals she trained uh, have come to celebrate and follow her are known as unicorns. So maybe we'll start with the unicorns, Jane. You're very welcome. You look beautiful in your lovely green outfit in that house, house of yours in W1. So very welcome. And thank you so much for participating in our conversation. So tell us why you have unicorns who follow you. Well, just a minute. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for inviting me. I think it's a great honor and extremely unexpected that you would want to know something about my life. So I'm pleased about that. I would prefer you not to give me a title that I don't have, which <laughs> I saw on the first label. So I'd be glad if everybody knows I don't have a title. I don't think my country particularly would like to give me one. But, um, that's <laughs> I'd like to I... give you one. <laughs> <laughs> you give it to me. So that's yeah, jolly yeah. nice of you, Roger, thanks. <laughs> anyway, you want to know about the unicorns. Well, the unicorns, founded themselves as my trainees, because I love to teach and they came from everywhere and I went everywhere and it was all great fun. And um, uh, they came back and they learned and they took it back to their own countries. And I used to tell them that they had to use their imagination, please, because we were dealing with a new specialty and uh, there was lots doctors didn't know. So they had to stand up to the plate and do something. and when they asked me but have you ever seen this i learned from actually from lord brock i said i've never seen a unicorn but should i meet one in the ward i would know what it is because i have that imagination to know that so they call themselves the unicorns because they were always being upbraided for not having enough imagination or not having something that was they should have <laughs> So, so what you I mean, you're famous for lots of things. Well, oh, I don't know about that. Number one being a rather a character, which is a good thing to be famous for. But I suppose, I mean, the, you were the first person to identify the fact that, that children who were operated on as babies had all sorts of problems later during adolescence and later in life. Is that right? Is that sort of survivorship? I, I think that's giving me too much credit, as you've already given me too much credit. But I think that um, actually I knew when I was a house officer in surgery and the patients frequently died, which was awful. But when one saw inside the heart, there was so abnorm much abnormality that one wondered what their occasional successes would happen to them. Also, when you saw what went on in the heart in the early days, and the surgery, you'd wonder if that was going to do them any good. So to me, follow-up was very important and wanting to know what happened, even when I was a house officer back in the 50s. Mm -hmm. when life was tough for house officers. Of course it was. But, Were you ever temp tempted to be a surgeon yourself? Did you want well, to yes, be a surgeon? I wanted to be a surgeon. Mm -hmm. I stayed on, I stayed on in, in thoracics and cardiac surgery for a year because I loved it so much. I mean, what a tough year that was. But, and the reason that I left were twofold. One, I'd spotted a man that I fancied um, more than somewhat. And two, because I recognized 
that my hands were not actually connected to my head. Indeed, I, I did wonder if some of the others might, who went on in, in surgery might have been less tombstones if uh, they'd followed my lead and left surgery. But anyhow, you weren't supposed to say or think things like that. I left and did medicine. Yeah, but, but you had a sort of passion for the surgical aspects. Always. To, yeah, yeah. Always a passion for cardiac surgery, really, really a passion. Uh, but I, recognizing you can't do something doesn't mean to say you can lo lose, uh, you know, lose your passion. I yeah. don't lose my passion and I've always gone to the theatre. I've always asked to look inside the heart. And Donald and Magda Yaku would always call me if there was something interesting to see. And particularly if I got the diagnosis wrong, you know, surgeons aren't necessarily very generous <laughs> to colleagues. But um, uh, yes, always, the passion has always stayed. And, and didn't you meet Alfred Blaylock from Johns Hopkins quite early in your career? Yes, yes. Yeah. He, he came to Guy's quite often. There was strangely enough, one of the early exchange fellowships um, and uh, he came to Guy's quite often. And that's when I fell in love with cardiac surgery, listening to him give the Carbot Memorial Lecture, how you could turn uh, blue patients pink. And mm -hmm. I said, that is for me. Of course, I hadn't contemplated that I was pretty clumsy. <laughs> well, you're probably overstating that. I mean, do you no, think I'm the fact? Clumsy. Do you think the fact that you were a woman was was a factor? Would, would they have allowed in those days a woman to be a cardiac surgeon? Do you think? Well, I don't know what men allow, but that didn't put me off anything. I mm -hmm. mean, I didn't take much. There. Having been brought up with boys all around me. I wasn't too impressed with what they'd allow and what they wouldn't allow and all their shenanigans. I mean, I learned about all that stuff at school. So yeah. I just sort of sailed on quietly and thought if I was good enough, I'd make it. Well, good for you. I mean, you, you, you've got a reputation for being a feisty lady. And um, d does that come back to your upbringing? Because you, 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 you had two distinguished parents, didn't you? And then the war came along. I had a very clever mother. My father, I was a really single parent. Mother brought me up. Very right. smart mother, very small, five foot two, very clever. Was a journalist um, and she believed in good education. And of course, as a war child, uh, one was sent out of London because that's what was ordered by Churchill, all children out of London. He wanted to secure the next generation, I suppose. Um, and I was educated with boys who I think got a better education than the girls, actually. Mm -hmm. you, so, you went out to Port Merion in, in Wales, right? Because yes. with all the children who were, who were sent out of London because of the, the bombing. Well, I mean, that's, that, that was, wasn't that the place where they filmed that um, yeah, absolutely. Late, and prisoner? It was just like that, as you saw in yeah. The Prisoner. Yeah. And we were educated in, the, in this pseudo-Victorian castle uh, built by a, a, a baron, I think a railway baron or whatever, he built this castle for himself in, in the 1890s. And that's where the, the quite smart uh, boys prep school was, was uh, um, taken from the East Coast where they thought the Germans were going to invade and resettled up in this castle. And there we right. stayed for three years. It was fantastic. And Clough Williams Ellis who brought, built Port Merion walked about and shouted sheep and we all had to leave our classrooms to fart, to chase the sheep off the lawns or whatever. It was great. <laughs> and and I, was it six girls were there and all the rest six were girls, boys? One dormitory, yeah. boys making, uh, drilling holes in the bathroom so they could see, boys drilling <laughs> holes to get into the uh, our one dormitory, which was in a turret. Boys <laughs> just as naughty as they are, always. Uh, so one learned all about that. You had to hold your own. If you weren't feisty, all sorts of things would happen. Right. <laughs> well, in, that, that, in, that's the woods, what... in the woods, it was yeah. great. <laughs> and, and you said just then that you're brought up by your mother. My you mother, didn't, you didn't get on with your dad very much or very well? I don't remember much. And he became a non-person to me really when I was at a medic medical school and he, he, he wanted to meet me and we arranged this and I went, I remember we were gonna meet in Fortnum Masons and he didn't turn up and I was pretty fed up about that. And I went back and all I received was a 
postcard saying, sorry, I couldn't make it. And you know, you know, in, in the hospitals, you can read everybody's mail on postcards. So I didn't like that. And I decided to me, he was a non-person. So right. that, I finished with that one. <laughs> so, so, so tell me then, you came back from Port Merion and that must have been towards the end of the war. Was that 43? Well, uh, I, I think the headmaster of the boys' school thought we were becoming a bit of a troublesome lot, or I don't know why. Um, and uh, so I think he was encouraging the girls to get out of the school. And I was brought back to Queen's College, which had just reopened and the flying bombs were around. Right. And uh, I can remember on the 73 bus getting off and, and because when the siren went, you had to get off. You weren't allowed to be on the bus. And, um, and in Kensington High Street, I remember. So we saw a few bombs drop. Do the doodle bugs, they called them. Doodle bugs, they? yes, yeah, doodle yeah. bugs. That's it. They were doodle bugs three and wasn't it? Yeah, three and four. I forget. So you could hear them come over. They they go quiet, and then there'd be an explosion. Absolutely. And there was this awful silence. Yeah, you'd be running around if you were happen to be on the bus, running where to go, or you go into a shop or something. Yeah. Oh, scary. So yeah. tell me then about medical school, because I mean, Guy's is a very prestigious medical school, very yeah, ancient and um, probably yeah. you, you must, there weren't many female medical students there, were 10% there? 9% when I went, 9%. I think we were the third year female and the government somehow had ordered uh, medical schools to take women. And Guy's was a very boy hospital and there was a lot of resentment about having girls and um well maybe i shouldn't tell the story but the senior physician uh walked about cursing about the girls sir john coney bear who'd written the book so he was a bit revered and i can remember soon after i arrived from school walking across the park and he shouts at the top of his voice to his retinue of boys uh Oh God, another bloody woman here. <laughs> so I just turned my turned up nose and the sniggering boys, I just didn't do anything. I guess I was supposed to bo uh, burst into tears, but you know, that, uh, that was long over since dealing with boys. It's not good if you want to master them to burst into tears unless you really want <laughs> something and you have to save that facility. <laughs> <laughs> and and you didn't do your first house job at Guy's. You went outside London. Did no, you? I didn't. I I waited, and I got appointed to the to the house in my second application, um, which was my first house job, and it was a nightmare job. It was a job that nobody really wanted. Uh, I was house physician to the Department of Medicine, which meant you had to be resident pathologist by night. Mm. and uh, uh, to all the uh, pretentious physicians by day in the, in the top, William Gull uh, um, Ward. But it, at least I was on the house, and that was my first house job. Were you, were you disappointed when you didn't get that, that f the very first house job you were? You were uh, yeah, oh, terribly disappointed, many yeah. years. I yeah. think Walter had to put up with that because I didn't get a house job. Either, so. <laughs> well, you mentioned Walter, but not everybody will know that you had a very famous cardiology husband called uh, Walter Somerville. Should be Sir Walter Somerville, really. But he was he was a very elegant man, wasn't he? And a very clever man. And he always had a carnation in his suit because he was, he was one of my teachers when I was a medical student at the Middlesex. And we loved him. We absolutely loved him. Tell it. Tell us about you. Know, when you you met him when he you were sixteen. Well, I met him. We we both lived in Edward Square. He was in digs at the end with a very crazy woman, and I, I was living in the middle, uh, that a house that my mother bought during the doodle bugs, and indeed they had dropped on the corner, uh, uh, taking out Lance Corner House just by the Odeon, and. I think we met with the girl next door. I used to climb over the garden wall to eat dinner next door. Very nice, very good cook, who <laughs> was the mother. And, the, uh, and Walter had been in chemical warfare with the people next door, with the people next door in Canada. Right. 
he went to Port and Down and he was involved in all that stuff. And then yeah. he went to Canada during the war. And then he was seconded to the American Armed Forces. Uh -huh. He wore pink, so it was very dashing when he came back from the war. He was a um, little bit older than you, Jane, wasn't he? He was. He was. Obviously, I was looking for a father figure, but he was very attractive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, very, very attractive. I don't think he wanted to get married, actually, particularly, but we started going out and we went out a lot. I used to, uh, he used to come down and meet me in the colonnade and we, you didn't get much time off when you were Brock's house, mm -hmm. certainly. Right. Um, but um, that was all right. He was also making his career and he got on the staff of the Middlesex and we re-met from having been in Edward Square. We re-met and started to go out when I, I was going up the stairs to the party. He was coming down to celebrate with his chief his appointment as consultant cardiologist. Right. He as an Irishman did not have an easy time getting mm -hmm. on the staff of uh, the Middlesex. And he had quite a lot of opposition. But yeah. his chief, Evan Bedford, right. was determined to have him. Right. He was, he was a very um, elegant man. Always suits were very well pressed. And um, did you iron his shirts for him, I Jane? I did not. <laughs> I did not. What a suggestion. And I advise all girls, you can't have a career if you're going to iron a man's shirt. So you better <laughs> send them out to the laundry early. I did earn it. I did earn it once. Right. And I burnt a hole in his favourite shirt. So that, <laughs> fortunately, whatever he did, I didn't see them. <laughs> never, never, ever. You can't. We don't have time for that stuff. <laughs> well, listen. You you probably know more about the history of cardiac surgery and cardiology than almost anybody else in the world. So we we must take this opportunity to get you to. To, to, to tell us about it. Tell, you mentioned Lord Brock, who actually was one of our neighbours. He used to live in the vicarage in Wimbledon, yeah. quite close to where I live now. But tell us about Lord Raymond Block. Um, he, he was a, a massive... Claude, Russell Claude Brock. Right. Was a very shy man and looked like the bank manager, but he mm -hmm. had a brain that was like a diamond. Right. Terribly shy, had three daughters, one of whom was my special friend, Angie. And uh, I was often in that vicarage that you um, talk about. He was completely woman ridden. He had his wife used to really give him a hard time. Poor chap would come in with his best vegetables. And then they, she said, no, I prefer them from the grocer. But he said, you know, he really had to put up with a lot and the three daughters. And um, uh, Walter was allowed to come to Sunday lunch sometime. And in those days, um, you had to ask your chief if you wanted to be engaged. Mm. So I said, please, sir, could I see you? <clears throat> yes, 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 what is it? He had this blinking tick, which was very off-putting, but I knew he was shy and I knew how to handle him because I'd also seen him being absolutely castigated by the girls at lunch. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I said, uh, I, I'd like to get engaged, so would that be all right? He said, not that fellow that tells me that I can't operate on aortic stenosis. So, because Walter had ex explained to Brock at the Peacock Club or one of these groupies where they met and drank and talked to cardiology and cardiac surgery, how it was impossible to do a valvotomy on calcific aortic stenosis because even bone cutters, orthopedic instruments would not cut through it. So what right. was ca cardiac surgeons thinking? So he was already poisoned against Walter. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, but he was, ni he was nice. I, they were the best days of my life. Uh, and he was famous for doing the first mitral valvotomy, wasn't he? Brock, is he, that right? Yeah, I was a student when he did that. Yeah. Um, Yes, but it was all terribly exciting. It was one, like one long incident of MASH. Yeah. When I became the house officer and we had this awful Lily High bubble oxygenator that Lily High had invented in a garage that wasn't safe at all. And the patients mostly died because they didn't get perfused enough. And we were in the theaters all day and we were weighing them on vernier scales. And, oh, it was a nightmare. We were there all day. Just, just uh, explain, because not all our audience will be uh, clinicians um, uh, we have all sorts of people listening into this and they won't be cardiac uh, or cardiologists so a mitral valvotomy and those uh, this was mainly for for um, rheumatic oh. fever yeah uh, 
or always rheumatic mitral valve, commoner yep. in women than men, and it was uh, as a result of rheumatic attack in childhood and ad or adolescence, the cusps, the two cusps of the mitral valve would fuse together. And uh, Brock uh, uh, did a mitral valvotomy, often with a knife on the end of his finger and entered via the, the sort of little cul-de-sac you could get into the heart with his finger and then he'd feel around and he'd split the cusps. Right. In fact, the first mitral valve after me was done in the London, I think, by Sutar. Could be. Uh, in the in the in the nineteen, I turn uh, nineteen twenty nine or thirty, and he was castigated for doing that, as most cardiac surgeons, who made innovations, were, mm -hmm. including Lily High, who had invented the bypass, right. was castigated, and his cardiac surgical fraternity criticized him very much because he put the patient, the, he connected the patient to the father or even a, a, a blood, not a, a blood, same blood group person who acted as a bypass. And uh, he was accused of causing, a, doing an operation that had the possibility of a 200% mortality, not just a hundred percent. And that's why he invented the oxygenator to do what the human body was doing, that he had connected the child uh, with a hole uh, in the septum uh, to the bypass, which was another human being. I've got a couple of questions here. Uh, uh, I mustn't uh, dominate all the questions myself. So um, Salam Al-Sam says, as a woman in a highly competitive specialty, did you feel that equality and diversity were not observed in the past, but are things getting better in this regard? And what safeguards do we have for uh, women to make sure that they can they have an equal chance to follow their passion? I think that's quite a good question. Well, it's a long question with a lot of aspects. Remind me the first bit was, was, well, there, was it, well, I think- There was absolutely <laughs> prejudice against the women. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and my feeling was that you just had to accept it, that you were in a boy house. You, you had to follow the rules of the boy house as much as you could. You didn't have to look like them. We didn't need to be liberated to look like a man or behave like a man. We could be our female self. And there are advantages of being, but there's no question, no equality. I don't think we were even equally paid. But we didn't, <laughs> since nobody knew what anybody was paid, how, how, how do we know in medicine if we were? I always said we were, but I think I was wrong. Because how did I know? Um, and so, so so I'm no, are things better now, do you think? Uh, politically correct, they're better. Uh, I think there's still gender prejudice. But the problem is there are so many women and it isn't okay not to accept us that I think things are much easier for the women, but now they're 62% women in medicine. If they don't employ them, uh, who are they going to employ? Mm. Mm. The country is short of doctors. So women are going to get jobs, but you'll find they're still hard getting to the top. There's still the prejudice that is discussed in the bar where we are not. What they do in gangs as boys, they now do it in the bar. I think, if they can avoid having a women, woman, many men would like to, but it's not okay to say, it's not okay to make those sort of sexist comments at interviews like, are you going to have a baby? Or, you know, do you think it's all right to wear your skirt so short? Or all that sort of stuff. I remember interrupting the senior physician chairing and saying, I don't think you have any right to speak about that woman. I said, she's just wearing a pussy pelmet and she's absolutely in fashion. The chat went so right, so red in the, <laughs> in the face that, um, uh, that he didn't ever take me on again. But I mean, they were awful, awful, awful. <laughs> and I think it's still there, but it's much easier for women. Yeah. It is much easier and we're accepted. By the way, I didn't eschew the course of fe feminism. Uh, which perhaps, and I ran into a few problems, I did think 
women were good and I did think women should be given a chance. And I did think always, as I do always think that we can be, we just have to be better than the men because we have a few disadvantages. And one of them is we take time off to have children. Yeah. Uh, well, you had, you had, I mean, you, you're a famous cardiologist and you were married to a famous cardiologist and you had four children. Um, I mean, that, that must have been, I mean, how, how did, did you look, end up looking after the children or did Walter look after the children? Yes, certain, oh, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> Walter never looked after any child. He would occasionally take them to some movie that he wanted to see. He would take them to church because I wouldn't take them to church because I was not of that faith. And he would take them and introduce them to uh, uh, a champagne cocktail at the Connaught. And then they'd come home to Sunday lunch, which I'd have cooked. That would be his sum total. He paid the school fees. He was interested in them and they all loved him dearly. And he taught them about wine and decanting and well, my boy, you must always treat women very well. Uh, we need them and, and um, uh, so he was that interested. Um, but did he do anything uh, domestic? No, and I didn't do a lot either. I had a wonderful housekeeper and we had nannies who were a nightmare mostly. Um, and that was, one was always frightened the nanny would leave and one would be left with all these children. Uh, I discovered when I was a senior lecturer in the heart hospital to Paul Wood originally that you could take off four times you could have four pregnancies and your salary would go up if you were an academic as I was a senior lecturer and lecturer so I had my four children it's not too not too difficult to get pregnant um, little did I know that they need something rather more than food and comfort but they're all around and they put up with my errantness and uh, as long as there was plenty of food and Maggie my housekeeper who was amazing uh, used to say, oh, go off to work. You'll just have trouble here. Yes, he is a naughty boy. That was my eldest son. He is a naughty boy, but he'll be, you'll be surprised. He might be the best of the lot. <laughs> I was complaining. Um, and they went off to school and they're still telling stories about how they got no mother's milk and they were sent off to terrible schools and they were sent to Switzerland and they were tortured by the granny in the house and all sorts of things. But anyway. They've survived and they're a lovely lot of children. We've got, we've got a comment from one of your unicorns here. Lisa Freeman says, as one of Jane's unicorns and a female Gooch cardiologist, Jane showed the way to be elegant and determined to be better than the rest of the class. So that's, uh, that's quite a nice thing uh, to say <laughs> Thank about you. Lisa, you're very kind. <laughs> um, very kind indeed. Thank you for being here, Lisa. <laughs> and Peter Worth mentions uh, another cardiac surgeon, Thomas Holmes Sellers. Um, who was a Uncle Tom? Yeah, yeah. Now, he was as good as uh, Brock was as difficult as an operator. When Uncle Tom operated, it looked beautiful, and you felt you could do it yourself. And the Middlesex had fantastic series and results. And Uncle Tom could was really a beautiful surgeon. Uh, really, it was worth watching. It was like a beautiful painting, which he could mm. also do. Brock um, used to say to Ross on the other side, as I was hanging onto the clamps, why does my house surgeon close her eyes when I'm operating? <laughs> Ross looked at me with triangular eyes in case I answered back, but I was tempted to say, because it looks like the dog's dinner and I don't know what's gonna happen next, but <laughs> th there was, it was rather fearsome. But the thing about Brock was he was a wonderful thinker, wonderful teacher, knew the diagnosis, and he did not have good cardiological support. Brock had to do everything. And he really was a great pioneer thinker. Yeah. Yes. I'm being told, told off by uh, Lillian Norton, who says, just wondering whether you can start asking more questions about Jane and her career rather than men. But the trouble is, the, um, all the people you work with were men. And, and we really do want to cover, you know, the history of, of cardiac surgery. There and was a woman surgeon that a cardiac surgeon who was a disaster really? in those days. And perhaps I shouldn't mention her name. She was appointed to the staff, I think, of University College Hospital, who I don't think ever recovered from it. But I never worked for a woman, actually. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, I think that it was good for me to have a man around. Let, let's talk about the the first heart transplant. That was Donald Ross, um, and and you know that was the beginning. That was shortly after Christian Barnard, I think you met Christian Barnard. Sorry, these are all men. Apologies, Lillian, but that's we've got to talk about them. T tell us, tell us a, a, a bit again. And the audience, remember, won't know all the details. So just the background, uh, and then ha you, you were actually there for the first half. I was right? indeed, and yeah. it was, you know, a great moment of life. Not the ideal moment to have three relatively small children at home, but could, cardiac surgery is much more inviting than domesticity. I can tell you. And um, the first heart transplant was a lovely chap called Fred West, an unfortunate name, but he was a lovely chap with ischemic heart disease, in ischemic heart failure, I think a patient of King's College. And the donor was um, a builder who was laying those huge concrete things that they fit in walls on big buildings and he just didn't position it and he fell through the the building uh i think 10, 10 or 12 floor no 20 floors up and of course um was a fit chap and that was the heart that went into the patient and donald longmore who ran the pump uh he was the clinical physiologist he was a uh, he wanted to be a surgeon, but I think he was moved into clinical physiology and ran the pump, really had the thinking about transplant. And um, anyhow, so that was what who was transplanted. And Donald called me and said, you want to be a physician to the first transplant? Stay here and you'll see me do it. And we it was amazing. I mean, the whole thing was so exciting, so unbelievable. And uh, Donald did the transplant and I looked after him and we had these meetings twice a day and we called Mowbray to help us with the immunology and Chris came by bringing anti-lymphocytic serum from South Africa because he was a friend of Donald's and it was all just one long excitement. And then Donald did two more and then the press who behaved as I said earlier on, very badly, so badly. In what way? Did, did tell us how did they well, behave badly? They, 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 well, they behaved. They were the true paparazzi, uh, you know, after the donor's family, after the uh, recipient's family, never allowing them any peace, running, getting up and down their chimneys and into their houses. And, you know, you know how they are. You know mm -hmm. how they are with the uh, royals and they were like this with the transplant until it became such that it was really difficult to find someone who'd agree to donation because the press could not be controlled. Mm. Uh, I understand their excitement. I mean, you know, I have, and it was a big story. I have to say that we didn't get a lot of um, support from our colleagues, but then cardiac surgeons in other units are terribly jealous not all, I'm sure, but you know, there's tremendous rivalry between the Tigers. Yeah. And they don't like someone getting away with something. I remember also when Donald did the first switch for transposition, we got absolutely lambasted by Great Ormond Street, saying it was mm -hmm. unjustified and da da da. So that was a bit sad. And it was very tough being in the transplant, but we were daft as brushes. We didn't know how to handle the press. Mm. The house governor said, would you come outside, all of you, and speak to the press? And there, you couldn't get across the road. There were so many television cameras, and of course we were on live, and we said dotty things, and we appeared with Union Jacks because we were proud to be British at the press conference, and we were got lambasted. And Donald did a very intelligent thing. Donald was very intelligent probably one of the most intelligent cardiac surgeon there's been very inventive very quiet oddly enough excellent surgeon has never been given what he justifiably should be in this country very naughty country we are very naughty about people <laughs> we reward and who we don't but that's all right and donald in engaged a press agent who was an unknown chap working in advertising or uh, John Gorst, who became a politician. He was very smooth, very smart, 
um, and uh, became Sir John Gorst, I think, and he was excellent. And he kept us away from the press. He would speak to the press and he would tell us what we could do and when we could do it. And this controlled things. Instead, they would chase us round. I mean, I remember going into, um, uh, we had car chases across London with the press in pursuit. Um, I can remember one Sunday morning and Donald said, you go out because they know you're the cardiologist and I will get out the back way and I'll get to Guy and I will be halfway across London by the time they know I'm not still there. So I did that and didn't speak to them. Of course, went home to cook the Sunday lunch, had the kids around uh, with me because what do you do when the nanny's off? All of that stuff had to be dealt with, transplant and all, they were brought up <laughs> on, on the floor of cardiac surgery. Oh, it was great. <laughs> well, I'm just going to read out a few things. Um, Sue, Susan Otten says, not a question, just a comment. Hello from Sue. Sir Keith was his daughter, just to let you know, you and your lovely husband were household names in our house. Lovely to hear the talk, she says. Uh, thank you sir, for that, uh, Susan. And Christina Carnegie says, my father anaesthetised the first transplant, David Carnegie. What, what, oh, were, the, what he, were the, what were the, what was the at memories of the atmosphere in theatre, she's asking. Oh gosh, uh, David Carnegie, Carnegie yeah. I loved him. He was, he was an anaesthetist when I was a houseman. And he <laughs> would say, come on my dear, you can open the chest if you hurry. <laughs> I'm ready, I'm ready. <laughs> So when I was Brock's houseman, so, oh, I love David Carnegie. Uh, <laughs> yes, indeed, he said. Oh, he was wonderful and he explained everything and he was quite, well, the atmosphere in the transplant, because the second one was done at Guy's and the, I think the third one was done at Guy's. So I remember traipsing over there. Um, I, I forgot David had, uh, oh, I just loved him. Um, um, that's so nice to think about him. <laughs> <laughs> there's a question. There's a question from um... the atmosphere in uh, in, yeah. in theatre in guys was was um, quite uh, rigid. Uh, uh, in the heart hospital, there was it was all quiet, and I can tell you when you look into the uh, recipient to take out. Uh, when you take out a heart and you see an empty cavity, when you take out the donors, it's it's rather disturbing, yeah. depending on which team you're in. So that leads to absolute silence because it was rather a terrifying experience. I was on the donor side once and on the recipient side another time holding the clamps. So that was exciting. In the heart hospital, it was it was slightly festive but absolutely controlled silence. You know, there was, but there was a, a, an atmosphere of excitement. The hot hospital was small. In guys, it was frightfully serious. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Chris, Christopher Rosa, Rosario, Rosario says, please give us the background on the Ross procedure and what it was like working with him. Oh, gosh, funny, I was talking to somebody about that. Only, I don't know, but in the last, uh, few days mm -hmm. uh, because my colleague uh, um, Derek Gibson who was a registrar at the heart hospital Donald had done a similar procedure at Guy's first it wasn't quite the same and it was sort of inside a cylinder and it was different the first Ross procedure I was waiting for my patient because I was kind of the surgeon's handmaiden which was exciting I was a semi-consultant being a senior lecturer and uh, I was waiting for my patient to come back from the theater wishing, and I said to uh, Derek Gibson, who was there uh, helping them look after the renal side of another patient, I said, Derek, what in heaven's name is Donald doing? He only has to replace the aortic valve and he usually does it much quicker. I need to go home to see the kids. He said, well, well, he said, he's done an extraordinary operation. He's taken the patient's pulmonary valve out and he's put it in his aortic after taking it out. 
Oh, I said, and what has he put in the pulmonary valve? Oh, he said he put a homograft in. That's why he did the first homograft on the right side, because he wanted to see if he could use the aortic homograft on the right side so he could do that operation. He'd already formulated the operation of the so-called Ross operation in 1966. There are four Ross operations. That's not the only one, but this is the famous one. And I said, what? So Donald comes waddling down. I said, where's the patient, Donald? What have you been doing? Oh, he said, I did a new operation. I said, well, thanks for telling us. Well, he said, let's see if it works. <laughs> the patient came back. It worked perfectly. <laughs> um, and, and, and I remember when the sort of the noise of cardiac surgery died down in the, in the chest, you couldn't hear any murmurs. I remember that's what struck me. It was absolutely gorgeous. Um, so one's always been interested in that, but it's interesting and I've always followed it and he did it quite a lot and we had a lot of deaths actually because they were too long on bypass with these hypertrophied hearts and the bypass wasn't good enough and the perfusion of the coronary arteries wasn't good enough. Uh, so we lost, I should think, a lot in the first uh, 11. I think we did that, did that upset you, all the deaths? Well, I, I, it did upset me, but I didn't go into floods of tears because cardiac surgery was um, was a sort of death business. Mm. You know, uh, advances in cardiac surgery meant increase in deaths. And yeah. we brought up in uh, in uh, Guy's Hospital. I mean, I spent as much time going down to the coroner's court. Indeed, that was nearly the end of my career in the coroner's court. Um, because I didn't really understand what was the matter with the patient, but uh, we, I was used to deaths. So you kind of get used to, I never quieted. I didn't like losing my patients at all. I thought it was awful, but you kind of get inured to it else you can't go on. Mm, mm. Brock speaks about this in one of his lectures in Canada. He said, we do feel it, we do feel it. You think we're heartless. Um, and but they, they can't be successful cardiac surgery if they have too much. Uh, they have a lot of courage with other people's lives, I think, mm. as well as having the courage of inventiveness. No, no ethics committee to talk to. They didn't yeah. have to ask anybody. Donald could just breeze down and say, shall we go for a drink? I've done a good operation. And that's <laughs> how it happened. And it was a good operation, but very few people can do it. They think <laughs> they can. And just being, being away, we mustn't talk about men too much for this particular one. So, Tell Christine, Han I'd love to talk about women. <laughs> Christine Hancock says, Hello, Jane, good to see you. I was, oh, sister hello, Christine. <laughs> <laughs> I was sister on Ward One of the National Heart when the first transplants were done. And then, this is this is fun. Ju Julie Wells, hello, Julie, as one of Jane's patients in the early 1970s at the National Heart, I was operated on by John Parker. Amazing times when pioneering surgery really saw advances. And we also a comment from Bernie Laban, who anesthetized for John Parker from St. George's. So John Parker was another good surgeon, wasn't he? Excellent surgeon, yeah. excellent. Yeah. Good person to talk to, very thoughtful. And I don't think George's was ever the same once he left the planet. Yeah, he, he died quite young, man. didn't he? Had a, he had oh, a we had a brain tumor. Oh, it was yeah. so bad. Desperate. I was there at his last birthday party and honestly, he could hardly function. Mm. Lovely family great courageous man and um i think um he he'd noticed on the morning that he had uh not seen something on the right when he was driving in and then he um he, he felt that something was wrong when he took the needle to stitch and then he r realized it was so sad so uh -oh. sad Oh dear, well, we've got another question from, or comment really, from Lisa Freeman. Will Jane tell the story of harvesting an aortic valve from a pig that had escaped in the mews behind the oh, heart hospital? Oh, the night of the piglets. <laughs> well, if I have to, I hope I won't be arrested. <laughs> uh, the night of the piglets, I think, was a Ross operation. I'm not sure. And the heart, they couldn't get the heart off bypass. So Donald Longmore, with all his inventive thoughts, said, why don't we see if I can get pigs, pig hearts, and we'll put them on live. Mm -hmm. So, okay, 
I mean, anything goes in those days. So the piglets came along, I think from the veterinary, uh, I don't know, he had links everywhere. And they, they got out of the bag and they were squealing in the mews and woke up the matron who opens the, uh, the door <laughs> and um, opens her window and says, what's all this noise? It's disgraceful, I'm reporting you to the senior physician tomorrow, all of which happened. But um, anyhow, the pig hearts, the piglet hearts were used and they, they were intensely rejected and went black within minutes. They, they functioned, they pumped the heart around the bypass, which was getting, they had been on the bypass too long, uh, the, the patient had been, and they worked as pumps, but they didn't last. They were acutely rejected. Mm. And that was that, and the poor patient, bless him, died. Um, but the silly Donald Longmore, my God, he must have done a few mad things, uh, as well as inventive, sends pork chops to the matron for her breakfast. <laughs> so that really uh, sealed the surgical fate. And she did report them to uh, the surgeons in, in toto and all their acolytes to the senior physician who stopped surgery in the heart hospital. <laughs> Well, now, Fel Felicia Cox, thank you, Felicia, is, says, uh, as a nurse who worked in the early days of cardiothoracic transplantation, what was the highlight of your career? And, and I suppose we ought to talk about your amazing work with, with adult um, congenital heart problems and the, and the sort of survivorship of that. I mean, think, would that be the highlight of your career, Jane, do you think? You tell us what what Well, what. I think the transplant was one of the highlights of my career. It's different between achievement for one, you know, when you're, you've got a goal. I think another highlight was becoming a consultant because I was told by Aubrey Leatham, you can never be one of us. And right. when he was Dean, and he couldn't speak to people like they did. And I said, I don't see why I can't be one of you and I'll be better. <laughs> I said that to him as Dean and he was cross and it reported me to Wallace Brigton. What did I care? Always being reported for something. Uh, what was the highlight? Well, definitely becoming a full, a proper consultant. Uh, and I waited a long time for that. I think I was very happy when the, the grown up congenital heart um, idea took off and people wanted it and realized that there were these patients and they had to be provided for. So I felt very happy about that, but it was awfully difficult and one was terribly obstructed. Um, I think um, being at the Just heart explain to the, the audience the sort of problems that people run into. I guess these are babies who've had surgery when they're tiny and then as they grow up, the valve oh, doesn't go with them. But infant cardiac surgery wasn't there. They were children, yeah. Yeah. adolescents, infants, newborns. And now fetuses have a little intervention uh, who have grown up and have residual disease in their hearts. And most complex heart disease are not total correction. That is a figment of surgical imagination that is unreal, except in one or two things, very simple things. And so they're left with problems that manifest sometime later or they've been, for instance, they're very complicated operations, have problems much of the time, the so-called Fontan operation, for very complex hearts that may only have one partition or may uh, have a valve completely sealed over and a big lump of heart missing. That is a, like radical palliation, really. And they have loads of problems without Fontan uh, initiation of that operation. Um, we where the right side of the heart is joined to the pulmonary artery and they function on that for a number of years. Without that operation, I doubt if the specialty would be needed, but patients with transposition have problems, all the survivors, they have coronary problems, the ones with the fancy operation who are switched, the early mustard and um, uh, operations where interatrium uh, baffles were used, have a lot of arrhythmias, ventricular failure, they get pump high pressure in the arteries to the lungs, they may have, all of them may get sign, uh, blue again, 
uh, bits of valve wear out or calcify, so they have to be replaced. Most patients who grow up with congenital heart disease and have anything other than a simple condition like a hole or a duct or a hole that's been closed in between two sides of the heart will have problems. Yeah, yeah. And you were the first person to recognize it, weren't you, really? In fact, um, John Keith in Toronto sent a rather errant cardiologist <clears throat> over to the Toronto General to make sure the rheumatics were followed. Um, and um, uh, that was the start of the Canadian involvement in grown up congenital heart disease because they had all these uh, transpositions who'd survived from the mustard operation um, by mustard, who was originally an orthopedic surgeon, as it happens. And they had all these survivors, a remarkable operation. And um, uh, so it, Canada did it. And then there's another chap who was trained with Paul Wood, who preceded me by a few years, called Joe Perloff, who uh, uh, I think we did this at the same time in the 70s, but I knew this from being a surgeon. I could not believe you saw inside those hearts and saw all the residuum that these people could have a normal life, even the few survivors, mm. even though they were celebrated. So I was into this in the 60s. Right, right. And also I couldn't get a job. I couldn't get on as a normal, ordinary cardiologist. I kept applying, didn't even get on a short list, even though I would think I was adequately trained as a cardiologist perhaps um and every all the boys got on and i never even got on the shortlist so i thought right i'm going to invent my own specialty so i'm the only one they can appoint <laughs> and the pediatricians didn't like me because i wasn't a pediatrician so i was a wolf in sheep's clothing or a wolf in their clothing whatever to them we haven't, men we haven't mentioned Paul Wood yet, um, uh, Jane, just to bring, tell everybody a little bit about because that was the Paul Wood ward. Um, well, yes, I named the ward when I finally got it, built it, paid for it, because I met a donor who took a fancy to me and gave me the money to build the, the adolescent ward and then extend it to the children's ward and gave me the money for it. I think he would want to remain... Um, anonymous as I promised and he'd had a child with uh, uh, he was a patient of Walter's and he kind of took a fancy to me as we were having a glass of champagne Walter and I on a Saturday and said young lady what would you like and I said oh sorry I'd I'd like a ward of <laughs> mine to have and and he said I'll send my advisors so a year later I got the money so they I, I was told I could have it if I got found the money Anyhow, that's the beginning of that, the adolescent ward and the children's ward in the, um, and I of course called it off to my, the best cardiologist ever was Paul Wood, ever, ever, ever. Great teacher, taught physiology at the bedside, wasn't terribly interested in anatomy, which rather upset me since I'd come from the surgical wards. Brilliant diagnostician, accurate uh, physical sign taker, so you were taught to write the signs before he came in. He would then take you apart. The place was like a circus, all these people wanting to be loved by Paul, um, all around, boys elbowing you out of the way, you know. I don't think there were girls in that, mostly boy, naughty boys. Although he, Paul, uh, Sheila, he knew the two Sheilas very well. Mm -hmm. And he was just a brilliant diagnostician and a kind clinician thoughtful, very, very good, very good, great sense of humor. And um, I got to know him well because he was a great friend of Walter's and Walter was the person he chose when he got his anginal pain and he died in the middle sex and forbade Walter, as the story is well known, to resuscitate him. He said, don't you open my chest. And a defibrillator didn't come till three months later. <laughs> he died with ventricular tachycardia, watched by Walter and the house officer who became a distinguished neurologist, I think. Oh, golly. 
Now, there's an interesting question here from Kate Bull. Thank you, Kate. As a physician who really did launch a new medical specialty, educated so many, looked after thousands of patients who had nobody else to turn to and was such a genuine pioneer, why has the Queen not recognised your contribution to medicine? Do you have a theory about that? <laughs> Queen has her own uh, advisors. <laughs> I think I've been very lucky. I don't understand anything that goes on in that. I'm very happy with all I got. I've had a great career and maybe there are many people that don't think I'm worthy of whatever, but I'm very British and I'm very proud to be British. And I thank you for your kind words, Kate. You yourself have made a pretty big contribution. And I don't, I can't answer these questions. I don't, I don't work, I never walked in the corridors of power. I just slept in them. <laughs> well, that, not surprisingly, David Ward has come in and reminded me that we ought to just briefly mention, we haven't got much time left, whistleblowers. Uh, I know that's a big interest of yours, and you, you're very, very keen that we cover it again in the, uh, the well, RSM, and I promise oh, yes. you... There is a... I am interested. If you ask you... I mean, you were going to ask me what I'm interested in now, if anything, yeah. other than enjoying myself. I am deeply concerned about whistleblowers. Right. In, uh, the doctor whistleblowers in these trusts. I can't understand why the trusts victimise them. I can't understand it. And often their complaints are not even seen to. They're sacked. They lose their careers. Their careers are stolen from them. The trusts behave very badly. And I even worry about the judiciary, not are, are prejudiced in favor of the trusts and not in favor of the whistleblowers. It is one of the scandals that the Department of Stealth is uh, not seeing to. I don't know why, whether they encourage the trusts to behave badly to these young doctors. I don't understand it. And I've just seen a young cardiologist, so naturally, who was found absolutely able to practice by the General Medical Council and they dismiss her as not fit for purpose, which I think is something you only apply to machines in law. I mean, what is going on in these trusts? Why do they have control of all this money? They can misspend 750,000 pounds. They can spend getting rid of a young doctor who complains. It is a disgrace. And unless something is done, and I encourage the RSM, please to have another conference because that's where I learned about it first. Please, it's vital for our young doctors. <laughs> okay, I promised you I, we would do that if, if you did this interview with me and you've <laughs> lived up to your part of the bargain. So back to me. Patrick Chung says, Professor Somville, fascinating listening to your amazing account of the golden age of innovative pioneering cardiac surgery. But this is what he wants to know. What advice would you give to the next generation of young clinicians who want to make their mark in cardiovascular medicine? What are the essential personal qualities that you need to make progress? Oh, that's quite tricky. One, managers, it? number one, but that's not very serious. I think, I think for the young, I feel very keenly. Do not use your skill as being as having as giving medicine an art. Medicine is an art as well as a science. You love the technology, you love doing things, but I still think you should be proper doctors, talk to patients, try and find out how they feel, consider them and be able to make a diagnosis at the bedside in whatever specialty you are. Use technology to be your friend, but not your only friend. You have to keep the art of medicine, I beg you. Please, it's been very useful. And one day you'll be on a desert island or in the desert and meet you. <laughs> did you enjoy doing that desert island disc back in 2013? <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. Of course. Yeah, I, I, did. I, would, I, would I would recommend our audience to listen to that. It's, it's fun to, uh, to. But actually, interesting, we have more time on this program than we do because there's so much music on desert island disc. So I think we, we somehow get more, more information in uh, the way we do it. Can I just say one thing? Uh, sure. I didn't end by what the poor patient Fred West died of, the transplant. Right. So he naughty, not a, he died of multiple pulmonary emboli, not of rejection. 
because Donald had made a technical mistake uh, by leaving two atrial appendages and he was just throwing off multiple minute emboli from the second appendage. And I, the physician, failed to diagnose what the cause of these minor fevers were. Mm, mm. So this is something I've always felt bad about. It was medical error. Um, being wow. a man, not being a man, I can say I make mistakes. <laughs> you wouldn't have had spiral CT to help you with the diagnosis in those. No, we didn't have either. anything, but right. I think it was an error. One knew about multiple pulmonary emboli. Mm, what mm. I didn't understand was the technique that he had done by twinning up the right, two right atrial appendages. Mm, it was wow. never done again, but Fred West died of that, not from rejection. Right, that's interesting to know, but I, should, I wouldn't feel bad yourself about it. The um, Actually, Terence, very quickly, because we're running out of time. In fact, we already have run out of time. Terence English, who I, I met uh, a few weeks ago, was was singing your praises like like most cardiac surgeons. We, you know, he he did. He got the Papworth set up going, didn't he? Oh, he got, did, and yeah, he did yeah. well for transplantation. Yeah. He got it uh, sort of sanitized and uh, accepted in the inter, in the corridors of intellectual power, you know. And I think that was important. He did a good job there for, yeah. from the Cambridge uh, Papworth, he, and that was a good unit. I think we better get him on this program sometime next year. We, um, we were already quite booked up, which reminds me. So don't go away, Jane, just a few announcements to make. Our next guest on In Conversation Live, we finished for this year. It's been fun, such fun doing it, especially doing Jane Somerville tonight. Um, ben Goldacre, the very controversial uh, doctor who uh, talks about drug companies and uh, various aspects of those is being interviewed by Simon on the 5th of January. So do tune in for that. And remember the RSM has been closed now for nearly two years on and off. looks as though we're going to be closed next year in the beginning because of this ghastly Omicron um, variant coming along. So if you are feeling generous and it is Christmas time, the RSM does need support. So please do send some donations in to keep, uh, keep the RSM on the, on the, on the road, the show on the road. And thank you so much, Jane. I, you, I, I was I was really looking forward to interviewing you. And actually, it's been even more fun than I thought it was going to be. So thank you so much. And have a lovely thank evening, everybody. Goodbye. You.